Farmers and ranchers have always adjusted to changing economic and environmental demands. Today's demands are challenging them with a new set of problems, problems stemming from development of neighboring land, oversupply of nutrients, and the loss of farm chemicals. Anymore in this area, everything is going to development. They've gobbled up the farms for, for housing development. A growing number of farmers and ranchers are adjusting to these problems with the help of an old practice, composting. We started composting because we ran out of land to apply this material to. But composting is not just about problems. It also offers opportunities. Opportunities to lower production costs, add revenue, and rebuild soil productivity. So far, we're very, very pleased with what we're getting out of the use of the compost. Because of the problems it solves and the opportunities it creates, composting is a useful tool for sustainable agriculture. Welcome to Composting, a Tool for Western Agriculture. I'm your moderator, Eric Anderson. Interest in agricultural composting is growing, and its use in the West is more common than many of us might think. It's not just a fringe activity anymore, but is becoming part of the mainstream. The goal of the program today is to explore how and why farmers and agricultural producers are producing and using compost. Now this presentation is not intended to be a how-to program about composting. In other words, we don't expect that you will be able to begin a large-scale composting operation by the end of the day. Instead, we want to introduce you to the breadth and the scope of composting operations in the West and to identify some of the key issues related to composting. We'll also direct you to additional resources that you can use to learn more about what is involved in a composting operation. We want you to be an active participant in today's program, so we encourage you to call in, fax, or email us your questions and comments if you happen to have internet access today. You may submit your questions at any time during the program. The telephone number that we want you to call is 800-390-7551. Again, that's 800-390-7551. We also have a toll-free fax number that you may fax in your questions and comments, and that number is 800-803-5998. Again, 800-803-5998. And we do have an email address, and that address is surwa at uidaho.edu. That's C-E-R-W-A at uidaho.edu. In today's program, we, we're going to present several short videos that describe the composting process and illustrate the wide variety of composting applications in the West. These videos will include several case studies in which farm composters will describe their experiences and explain why they use composting in their operations. We'll also have question and answer sessions here in our studio with a panel of composting experts. In addition, we will be taking a 10-minute break shortly after the midway point of the program. We also want you to know that you are part of a large number of sites throughout the West and beyond that are partici participating in today's broadcast. Many of these downlink sites have planned additional activities such as offering local discussions of important issues relating to composting. Also take note that today's program is part of a series of satellite broadcasts about agricultural composting. We will tell you more about our second program in the series near the end of our broadcast. It is also important for us to recognize the financial support that we've received for this program. This broadcast is being funded by the USDA's Western Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, or SARE. SARE's mission is to expand knowledge and adoption of sustainable agriculture practices that are economically viable, environmentally sound, and socially acceptable. Once again, our goal today is to bring agricultural composting into, in the West into sharper focus for you. We'll begin with a short primer on the basic process of composting. We're here at the farm composting facility at Washington State University to provide a quick primer about the process and methods of composting. Composting is a simple process that turns diverse organic materials into this. 
compost, a valuable product for plants and soils. During composting, microorganisms use oxygen to decompose organic compounds, creating carbon dioxide, water vapor, and heat. The heat produced raises temperatures of the material to over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or 55 degrees centigrade temperatures high enough to kill wheat seeds and pathogens. Over time, the organic materials gradually change character and become a consistent product, which we call compost. The process takes from a few weeks to many months, depending upon the conditions, starting materials, and the qualities desired of the compost. The process happens faster if oxygen is abundant, and the materials have the right balance of carbon, nitrogen, and other nutrients. Without enough oxygen, the process becomes anaerobic, then other compounds form, some of which are odorous. Some odorous compounds can form even under aerobic conditions, but the intensity is much lower. Getting oxygen into the composting materials is a challenge. In some cases, air is forced into the piles with blowers. But most composters rely on passive forms of aeration, such as diffusion and thermal convection. Turning also provides a fresh charge of oxygen, but under intense composting conditions, the introduced oxygen lasts only hours. The longer lasting effect of turning is to fluff the materials, making passive aeration easier. Composting methods largely determine how oxygen is provided and how materials are contained. The turn windrow method is typical of most farm composting operations. We bring in uh, our ingredients from uh, various places on the campus, and these ingredients vary from uh, coal ash from the power plant, food from the dining halls, uh, feedlot manure, uh, separated manure from the dairies, and then uh, uh, very extreme uh, high bedding concentrations from the uh, vet hospital. We separate these sources uh, primarily by their moisture uh, consistency, and then we build our windrows according to our waste stream. And we essentially mix the dry with the wet and form our windrows and then those windrows are turned immediately. As soon as we get the windrow turned and it homogenizes, mixes, blends, and adds some oxygen to that first initial stage. Uh, these windrows are 12 feet wide, uh, 5 feet high, and approximately 200 feet long. And uh, we turn these windrows on a uh, periodic basis based on uh, temperature. And in the first week, they'll be turned about twice, and the second week, down to once and then they'll stay in this winter configuration for about 10 weeks before they go into a curing or land application. Uh, we do have markets that are uh, associated with greenhouses, landscapers, hydro seeders, th those types of people and that comes out of a curing pile. There are other variations of window composting plus other methods used by farms. Some composters prefer to leave materials undisturbed in relatively static piles. Turning occurs only a few times during the cycle. These composters rely on time to make compost happen. We have found that um, a method that we call the static pile method works a little bit better for our particular situation. The materials are mixed well, put into the piles, and then we use a mulch cover. Uh, we find that this discourages flies and contains any odors, uh, conserves nitrogen, um, as well as water. Now these piles we turn um, a minimum of, the first turning is a minimum of 60 days. And we estimate that with the static pile method it'll take approximately a year. Uh, by the time uh, that year is up, the compost is fairly fine. With more turning, compost can be produced faster. But special turning machines are not necessary. Many farm composters use loaders or other equipment for turning. We win or our manure and bulking agents and then we uh, take an excavator and move it to the side into another windrow or blend two together to get our mix. I feel that it's, it's a cheaper method and because we can move more volume with the excavator and we could with front end loaders. We've not tried the side turners but we like the excavator because we can blend the different agents cheaper by having uh, be able to move completely around a circle uh, from side to side and reach out 35, 40 feet. Several farms in the West follow the controlled microbial composting, or CMC method, which stresses aerobic conditions and high quality compost. 
CMC practitioners turn frequently and may add clay and microbial inoculants to the feedstocks. Our turn parameters are dictated by our testing procedure and we will turn for temperature or CO2 content. If the temperature is going to be at or exceed 145 degrees, we will turn regardless of what the CO2 is. If we test the CO2 and we have a content of CO2 above 10%, uh, that will require turning. Typically with our feedstock materials, we find that we turn more for CO2 content than we do temperature. Uh, the CO2 is twofold. One, it shows the presence of aerobic bacteria breaking down materials. Uh, our typical windrow uh, for this site, we turn an average of between 30 and 40 times before the compost is, is showing CO2 levels consistently below 10%. The time the compost takes in the windrow will vary according uh, to temperatures. We finish windrows in as little as four weeks. Uh, that was an inoculated windrow. Uh, we've had other windrows that have taken up to 10 weeks before we're seeing uh, the testing parameters indicate that the compost is finished. When we look at the expenses involved in composting from start to finish, turning is actually an insignificant portion of it. Uh, we figure that our turning costs uh, are approximately 10 cents per turn. And so 30 turnings, we've got $3 of turning cost in it. Turning can be avoided altogether by supplying air directly with passive aeration aids or with blowers, as in the aerated static pile method. The key to the aerated static pile method of composting is its simplicity. In this system, we have a simple blower here, simple drainage pipe, it's perforated allows the air to come out beneath the pile. All of this is operated off of a timer. It's a cycle timer that allows the aeration to uh, uh, turn on and off uh, at desired intervals during an hour's time. We build the material on top of the pipe network and we're able to control the temperature and moisture content of the final product. Finally, a variety of in-vessel systems combine the advantages of forced aeration and automated turning. Our uh, composter runs on a railroad track and it uh, approximately moves a foot of product every minute. It takes uh, an hour and 20 minutes to get down all the way to the end of the building and another hour and, hour and uh, 20 minutes to come back. Uh, each morning we'll transfer the, the composter to the next bay and start up the, the same process. The product is mixed in at one side of the, the building. Uh, with our chicken manure and uh, our carbon source, uh, rice hulls and other wood forest products. Uh, with the right uh, ratio, carbon nitrogen ratio, uh, uh, it will heat up in the, uh, approximately to 140, 150 degrees the next day. Uh, the product stays heated uh, th uh, the same temperature, 140 to 150 throughout the 30 day mixing period. After the mixing period, when it's dumped into the pit, it, uh, we pull it out with our tractor and windrow it outside to uh, cure the, the product. Which method is best? Our composting system uh, for us at this location, I think, is, is one of the best uh, systems that's available. We can move it faster, more economically with, with the excavator than side turners or front end loaders. The only style of composting that I recommend to people you're probably getting the sense that there are many different approaches and philosophies about composting. The important thing to remember is that there are many acceptable ways to produce compost. Situations and feedstocks differ, climates vary, and the reasons for composting are different from one operation to the next. As a result, a producer needs to take all of these factors into consideration to determine the best method of composting for his or her operation. More information about the process of composting is available in the resource notebook that you received by registering for today's program. Now, to give you an idea about the diversity of techniques and approaches currently being used in the West, we'd like now to take you on a tour of composting operations. Our first stop on the tour is the composting site at Lindy Dairy, run by Lincoln & Associates, a compost service company who composts a variety of farm and food materials for nine different clients. Our equipment is portable. 
it, uh, within a half an hour we can be uh, road ready or we can be ready to turn in the row once we get there. The composting is working out very well for the clients. Uh, it has gotten a lot of them back into compliance with the uh, with ecology. Uh, it keeps the manure off the roads, and they uh, they have a place to put it all the time. When Jack uh, came and approached us about two years ago about the idea of composting, uh, we thought it sounded like an idea that was worth giving a try. Uh, we started last year and we moved about 1,700 ton of. Uh, of dairy waste as, as, as compost material and we'll probably do about four times that amount this year. I think uh, in retrospect uh, the main advantages that we've gained, uh, well there are several really. Uh, although it has not been a large money maker for us, it has been a money and a time saver for us and uh, the reason that is is that uh, Lincoln and Associates, uh, they, they find a home for the, the dairy nutrients or the compost once it's made, that's something that's out of our hands and we don't have to worry about, saving us a lot of time and, tr and costs associated through the uh, transportation. On to Abbotsford, British Columbia. This 200 sow farrow to finish swine farm uses an aerated, agitated bed composting system. We are composting primarily uh, pig manure, but the pig manure is mixed with sawdust shavings because the pigs are uh, housed on uh, bedding. So we are actually composting for two reasons. Uh, to process our pig manure and secondly to um, uh, reap the economic benefits uh, from it. The compost system we use is called an in-vessel composting system. There's a good aeration system that we have virtually no odors. If you're very close to the building even you're not able to smell uh, any odors and the neighbors have never complained about any odors. Flies in the system are non-existing. Never any flies. Th this system sure has met our expectations. Now it's off to Kona, Hawaii where a pilot project used composting to control insects and recycle the husks from macadamia nut production. Well, when I came to Kona, I noticed there was a lot of uh, unused macadamia husk, macadamia waste from the processing laying around. Um, and there was also this new problem of this macnut beetle. And people were just leaving it out in their fields and it would continue to spread. So we looked at a way to combine two things, and that is create a compost, a nutritional uh, soil amendment for the orchard, and also hopefully kill the insect through composting, which uh, we turned out being able to do. We also looked at using chicken effluent from a local poultry farm here, Kona Poultry Farm, and mixed that five parts magnet husk to one part chicken effluent. Within seven weeks, it was fully decomposed, but within two weeks, the beetle was killed. We had a 100% kill. Actually, uh, more farmers have decided to um, take on composting. It's a big paradigm shift for this area because most people just want to burn and for years they could get permits and burn and, and if you have the macnut beetle you can still get a permit from the health department or the county agent to burn but we're encouraging people to compost instead and that includes their um, coffee prunings because there's another beetle that's related to the macnut beetle that gets into the coffee prunings and if they compost that they can uh, kill that beetle also Make sure your tray tables and seat backs are in their upright position as we head back to the mainland, Santa Cruz, California to be exact. Glom Egg Ranch has over 80,000 birds producing 72,000 eggs and about 10 cubic yards of manure each day. We uh, in the past have uh, dried our manure, uh, spread it out and dried it in the field. We've uh, liquefied it and, and uh, uh, stockpiled, it with, uh, stockpiled it dry with shavings on top of it. We've tried uh, numerous things. In 1988, we uh, came across a uh, composter that would uh, be probably ideal for uh, composting manure, uh, such as ours. It's a farmer automatic composter. Uh, and uh, through uh, several experiment years, three or four years of uh, adding different types of uh, carbon source to our uh, uh, manure, we finally came up with a, an ideal uh, compost product that we could uh, sell by uh, bulk, by bag, and uh, it's become you know, quite a good uh, uh, s source of income. 
you know, for the, the egg business. Next, we visit the innovative composting site of Full Circle Compost at Milky Way Farm in Minden, Nevada. Initially, we started into composting specifically to address our manure management. Uh, and our focus was a little different at first, and as I began to learn and understand more about composting, uh, my focus was uh, sort of directed towards high-quality compost and what interaction high-quality compost has with the soil. Our composting sites uh, here at Milky Way Farm are a little bit different than some in that we compost right in the field. And what we prefer to do is we prefer to use the composting site in the regular rotation cycle for our 160 acres. Typically we'll rotate 10 acres per year out and so when we go to rotation now we compost on that site for that first year of rotation. Then what we'll do in the second year after the compost has been made and applied and the yard is empty we will replant that typically to a nitrogen loving uh, crop of some sort. And what we rely on then is we rely on this crop to then take up any nutrient excess that could be left on that site. We use quite a large acreage so that we're not cramped, so that we have easy access uh, to our compost windrows. We're heading south now to Canutillo, New Mexico. Calhoun Farm Services compost dairy manure at several sites and makes use of discarded vegetables from the local cannery. We, we started uh, handling a, a local canneries chili waste which consists mainly of chili pills if I wasn't here and they were still hauling it to landfill it's a much more expensive uh, cost to them and it's it's a waste of our landfill uh, they were very conscious of this and so they wanted to do something different as well so it was a a, a team deal between the cannery and myself uh, I did the work for them, and I have saved them some money. They have diverted from the landfill. Uh, their trucking costs are less, um, and so it, it's been a win-win situation for, for both of us. Next stop, Longmont, Colorado, near the beautiful Rocky Mountains. Brian Hoagland at Soil Rejuvenation Products started composting just to help out his father. Uh, we started composting my sophomore year of high school and uh, basically we started because my dad couldn't get rid of his manure in his dairy and he just needed a place to go with it and he came to me one day and said Brian would you like to start composting and I kind of laughed at him and said what's that I used to think that was for hippies but uh, we started doing it and uh, it's doing pretty good for us uh, I've been in it for five years now there weren't too many people doing it when we started. We've tried to make a product that somebody can lay down in their yard or in their garden. They can till it in, they can turn the sprinklers on, and it won't smell. It'll have a sweet, musky smell. Their neighbors aren't going to call them bad names. Uh, we try to make a product that has no weed seeds in it. We guarantee it with no weed seeds. The quality of our product has ensured some of our success. But marketing is an ongoing challenge, and that is what makes a composting operation successful. Anybody can make compost, but somebody needs to sell it. Farmers are a different breed. You have to sell it to them in an appropriate manner. And I think if uh, we as composters work at it and put a lot of effort into it, I think that compost could have a good future. In Hiram, Utah, E.A. Miller Incorporated composts paunch manure from its meatpacking plant. The feedstock that we begin with is paunch manure, the undigested stomach contents, which really is ground feed. Corn, hay, oats, barley, some wheat. So we began composting because we, we didn't have another option. The landfill costs are very high. The farmers locally don't want any more of the material on until it's been composted. And so we began composting as uh, basically a cost avoidance. Uh, in fact, right now, we are, if we were to dispose of this at the landfill, the cost, the tipping fees are $38 a ton. Uh, we will go through approximately 50 tons a day if this material gets delivered. 
so you can run the math through we operate 277 days a year that's a lot of material we began composting and it did two things it reduced the volume that we had to dispose of and then also it gave us a product that actually had some value so we began to sell it and use it on our own land now let's head north to Emmett, Idaho, where Merrill Egg Farms has about 450,000 birds, producing about a quarter million eggs a day. The farm is taking advantage of their high-rise barns to implement an in-the-barn composting system. We began composting because uh, of the same reasons we are now. We have a lot of product that, that we don't really have a good use for other than just to apply it to our fields. Our fields are starting to be saturated. We have just started this uh, last about two months ago with a process of composting underneath the birds in the, in the high-rise houses. As the manure comes down, it normally just stacks in, in a pile down there underneath the cage rows. And uh, we, we have a stirrer that uh, goes through and rolls that manure into a windrow underneath the, the birds and uh, the, the real advantage there is that we're not out in the weather, uh, the rain and so forth, we can, we can take care of that uh, right in the house that's already environmentally controlled and uh, the heating process seems to be working um, and so it, it seems to, to be very beneficial to us at this time. We finish our tour in Nampa, Idaho, where Stewart Farms compost dairy manure for use on their own fields and for sale in collaboration with Roger Wood of Compost West. With the exception of the Stewart Dairy, who does all of the compost uh, making themselves and I just sell it, all of my other clients are people who bring the material to me on a piece of ground that's de on their farm where I then do the composting and remove the compost by selling it to other purchasers. We began composting in uh, 1991 when Roger Wood came by and was wanting to uh, compost our stockpile of manure and uh, we've worked with him from there on and uh, you've continued composting uh, not only for uh, you know product for sale but also product for our own use. Yeah, we're figuring we use about uh, all around 8,000 yards on our fields alone and then uh, with Roger's marketing and uh, Anybody else that stops by, we figure, been selling about 16,000 yards a year. The fact that we can um, move on to the composting operation with a great learning curve at this point is somewhat of an advantage. And I think it's fair to say that virtually everyone that we work with uh, has a severe limitation in time and availability of management. Uh, most of these folks are very, very busy with their current operations and just don't have the manpower and the management to take on one more job. Now that we've shown you the variety of approaches to composting currently being used in the West, we'd like to present some specific examples of how farmers and producers are using composting to help enhance their operations. But before we do that, I'd like to review for you our phone number and our fax number and encourage you once again to submit your questions, comments, and concerns to us regarding the uh, examples that, that we're showing you. Our phone number, again, is one 800 390-7551 and our fax number is 1-800-803-5998. Now we'd like to go to our first case study. In it we travel to Alberta, Canada where a large feedlot operation has established a partnership with a commercial composting operation to manage animal manure. In the past, manure has been applied generously to fields near feedlots and dairies. Now many of these fields have become saturated with nutrients, forcing producers to look farther for application sites at greater handling costs. If we weren't composting on this lot and the raw manure was going to have to be hauled, we'd be looking at probably farther and farther hauls, probably up to 10 to 15 miles. In an effort to reduce handling costs, Roseburn Ranches in High River, Alberta has formed a mutually beneficial partnership with a compost producer, Eco Ag Initiatives. The feedlot gains a nearby outlet for manure and the composter gets raw materials and a site for composting. We are not packing it 10 miles. We now only pack it to the edge of the, of the, the lot itself. Um, we now are able to use all our own implements that we use on a daily basis. We aren't hiring extra people and creating more dust in the lots. We aren't creating 
neighbors with um, problems on the roads by traffic when we bring in 30 trucks to move all the manure out. Now we can do it on a timely base and it's a routine so everybody knows what they're doing so the efficiencies and use of material or from the material handling equipment is exponential. The cost reductions that we see in materials handling have been uh, traditional levels of four dollars a ton, three to four dollars a ton to move it to the field and spread it. Now we're only looking at a dollar a ton and that includes scraping and, and making sure the lots are manicured back up to where they need to be. And so that dollar a ton just to the site is a three dollar savings from traditional methods. We believe that the, that the value to the feedlot is in the cost reduction of his manure handling program. Uh, we do not believe that we can pay the a feedlot operator uh, any money for this material. Uh, it has to be delivered to this site on, uh, and the construction of the site has to be his responsibility for this whole program to work. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work on that area and uh, uh, I am afraid that uh, if, the, uh, if it didn't work that way that uh, this, this operation would not be viable. Besides handling manure more economically, composting yields other benefits including effective use of the manure's nutrients within agriculture and better animal quality. The cleanliness of the cattle means that we can go in there and because we are in only 100 frost free days, we have to be able to clean these pens on a year round base. That gives us a place to take the wet manure to be composted during the winter months. That way we can clean the pens, keep the cattle from getting wet hips, and with high speed plants that are now everywhere where they're killing 4.6 head a minute, any kind of tag or carcass damage is eliminated. And those benefits are strictly on you get full price for your animal instead of seeing dockage. The operation works well because each of the partners has clearly defined their roles and responsibilities. The liability for the site is still a responsibility of the feedlot. Uh, the product for manufacturing is the responsibility of the compost site or the composters. Um, once it's on the site, they can use wastewater um, at their cost from our ponds to put with the piles and the carbon content comes from the bedding packs. So it's up to them to make sure we mix it right, but really our only responsibility is the loading and the hauling to the site. The actual method is to, uh, is to bring the material onto the site. We like to see it turned as, as soon as possible as we, after we get it onto the site. Uh, we like to uh, run through the, uh, the whole pad once and then come back immediately and turn a, a second time. We're trying to get our, uh, our heat up immediately to start destroying the weed seeds. And uh, we feel that by turning and mixing the second time, probably after the second time, uh, we'll, we'll have the weed seed problem uh, beat right away. After we produce the, the, the compost, uh, it is going to, uh, to distributors. Um, we're working with a distributor right now who is responsible for the, uh, for the marketing of the material in both the agricultural uh, um, direct to, to farms or uh, into the horticultural market. The agricultural market is by far the most, more, most important one to us because it is the only one that's uh, large enough to, uh, to absorb the volumes of, uh, of materials coming off the, uh, uh, from the feedlots. Uh, we feel that our target area around a feedlot is to supply the uh, compost uh, uh, probably a maximum of 30 miles from, the, uh, uh, from our compost sites. The key to the success of this partnership is that it benefits both partners. Composting within the feedlots on a growing program will have to be based strictly on economics. If it's not economically viable for it to carry on, it'll die. So costs associated with it have to be looked at through a microscope to make sure that you get them down to the smallest part. In any project that you take on, the economics are the biggest driver of its lifetime. Animal mortalities can pose significant disposal problems for agricultural producers, especially for large-scale animal operations. 
Composting can be an effective method to eliminate these waste materials. In fact, a 1996 survey of U.S. farm composting operations found that composting animal mortalities was the most common practice. In particular, composting bird mortalities at poultry farms represented the largest application. Nearly 20% of the poultry farms in the largest poultry producing states composted their animal mortalities. In this next case study, we visit two different sites that have found similar benefits with composting. Disposing of on-farm animal mortalities is a serious concern for producers. One option is rendering, which makes use of the carcasses but poses potential disease or biosecurity problems from trucks moving among different farms. Another option is incineration, which can be expensive, wasteful, and time-consuming. If I was incinerating, when you get to the end of a grow, when you're having bigger birds, you can't put them in as much. and It's like a 24-hour-a-day period for that last part of the grow. Draper Valley Farms raises about 30 million birds on facilities located throughout Washington and Oregon. To an operation of this size, composting has many advantages. The main reason was the environmental safety because this process is environmentally very safe process. Number two, we are also uh, concerned about the biosecurity issues involved into rendering facilities and sending birds out of the farm. So. That's another thing. And the third main issue was the com uh, this incineration uh, method takes a lot of time. So the labor saving was the main thing. So Composting the birds is handled on a daily basis. The mortalities are combined with recycled litter and straw. We start out with a layer of uh, litter. And then we put a layer of straw. And what I do is I use a half a bale of straw. And it's a 70 to 75 pound bale. Then, uh, then we put our mortality on top, the birds, and then I put another layer of litter on top of that. Per day, I'm putting in about 100, 150 birds. The beginning of the grow is more, and down towards the end of the grow, we get less birds. I spend probably 30 minutes a day composting, and that's doing it twice. So it's about 15 minutes a time. It takes a little bit longer when I'm emptying the bins over to the back but that's once every week and a half or so. The main benefit is uh, labor saving, time saving, and uh, our farm managers can spend more time on bird management rather than spending time uh, disposing the bird. I definitely feel like this is one of the best methods available for the poultry industry. The practice of composting mortalities has only been underway for the last two years at this small fish hatchery operated by the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls. Before that, the material was taken to the local landfill. That just seemed like a, a messy way, uh, a waste of, of material, plastic bags, you're carrying uh, uh, composed, uh, decomposed fish in bags, and, and so that just seemed like there had to be a better way, and I didn't really like the idea of a of a mortality pit. Um, so the idea of the, the pilot project with looking at composting mortality seemed appealing to me at the time. The compost system that we use for our size of uh, mortality uh, is three bins, uh, approximately four feet by four feet by four feet. Uh, we start out with uh, a layer of amendment, uh, about six inches of the straw or whatever we're using at the time, and then layer our, our mortalities with another layer of amendment and then just work up that way. That, in order to fill one bin, it takes approximately two to three weeks time. At that time, that first bin is rolled over and turned into the second bin, and then the, the first bin becomes our new bin. And so it's just a, a rollover process from one to two, two to three, and so on down the line. And then by the time the materials have gone through the third bin, we can stack them out on the ground with our amendments and it's, uh, odorless and basically earth-like and dry. Our mortality uh, per day ranges from uh, as little as five pounds to upwards of 30 pounds. The, the labor involved, once your system is up and running, is about 10 minutes a day to uh, carry your mortality, weigh them, place them in layers, cover them with uh, the amendment, close the lid, and, and then you're back uh, doing what you, you would do the rest of the day. You know, originally I thought odor would be our, our main problem, but uh, 
odor is, is not a is not an issue. When we roll the bins, there's there's heat and steam and ammonia odor, but not um, a rotting odor. It's more just a, a cleaner or ammonia odor, and and that odor surprisingly uh, doesn't carry very far. I think our major um, obstacle or or distraction in the compost process is really the fly larva and the flies themselves. We've been doing the, the composting of our mortalities about two years now. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with the results we're getting and, and the direction we're going. I, I can't say that we've dialed in on the, on the best scenario yet, but I think with the use of different amendments, uh, recycling the, the third bin materials, uh, it's so much cleaner for us to take mortality out on a, on a daily or twice a day basis put down a layer of mortality, an amendment. Uh, it's probably 100 yards to walk out there. Uh, the mortalities are, are fresher. We can weigh them right on a scale, know exactly what we're putting in, uh, rather than have to bag and haul in a vehicle, put them in landfill. So I, I wouldn't go back to uh, taking care of our mortalities in, in landfill. I'd, I'd stick with the compost. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our panel of composting practitioners and experts who have joined us in our studio. On my left is Bruce Miller, professor, associate professor of agricultural systems at Utah State University. Bruce is a specialist in animal waste management. Next to Bruce is Bob Rink. Bob is an extension waste management engineer at the University of Idaho. Uh, Bob was also the presenter in the primer on composting that we began with in our show. And I might also point out that Bob is the overall director of this entire compost education project. Next to Bob is Peter Moon, who is a composting consultant and educator uh, from Western Washington. And Peter also does his own composting as well. And then finally, we have Dan Caldwell, farm manager of Washington State University's Animal Sciences Research Farm and supervisor of the WSU composting facility. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Good morning. I'd like to begin with a couple of questions uh, regarding the case studies that we've just seen. Now, the, our, in our first case study in Alberta, Bob, you were on site uh, during the filming of that case study, and I wondered if you could just elaborate for us a little bit about some of the problems that the ranch there faced in terms of manure handling before they began the composting operation. Uh, well, before they began composting, they had a small window of opportunity to remove manure from the feedlot. Um, they're very severely constricted by the weather. And during the wintertime, um, when the Chinook winds blew in and uh, things warmed up a bit, they had a short time to remove just about all the manure from the feedlot, take it out to the fields and uh, a field stack it at that time, and then wait for spring to spread it in the fields. Um, now that they're composting, they can re remove it on a regular basis and just take it to the, to the edge of the feedlot for composting. So it saved them a lot of time, uh, and timing became a, a great deal easier. Okay. Now we've seen two examples uh, of the type of partnership that was demonstrated there in Alberta with the farmer and the composter working together. I'm just curious, how common is this type of arrangement in the West? Uh, it's actually becoming more common. It, it seems to be a very successful model for composting on farms. Uh, because the farmers are so busy with operating the farm and um, producing products from the farm, um, they don't have a lot of time to invest in the composting operation. And when you get large enough in composting, particularly when you reach the point where you're marketing material, uh, composting on, almost becomes an enterprise in itself. And it requires a dedicated person. Um, a composting company or a composting entrepreneur can come in and take over some of those responsibilities, and the farm still retains many of the benefits of compost. Now, can we extrapolate that situation to a, a, a smaller scale operation, for instance? If, uh, are there still benefits to composting manure if the compost is not marketed? Dan, you compost manure at, at Washington State University. You do market your compost, but I guess you must have started at some level, and so you know, can you describe how you might use that internally? Yeah, our initial um, attempt to uh, handle our, our finished product was land application, 
and the market uh, has developed from that just because of the the demand for that product. But um, there's great benefit to the land by putting it back on the soil, and um, a home application or a home farm application works very well to put it back on the land. Okay. I'm also curious about uh, the producer talked about needing clear roles and responsibilities between the, the farmer and the composter. Uh, I'm wondering if any of you have experience in those type of situations where do these need to be spelled out in, in writing? Uh, it's a verbal type of an agreement. Uh, okay, uh, how, how concerned does a producer need to be that the composter then is going to you know, carry out uh, the work? Well, I haven't heard anyone talk about a written agreement between the composting entrepreneur or the composting company and the producer. Um, in all of these operations that I've visited where that model exists, uh, the relationships seem to be very friendly and amicable and, and work quite well. Um, the roles are fairly clearly defined, but that doesn't mean on a week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis they don't shift a little bit when the, the compost is short, the producer takes over some of the work. Um, but in general, yeah, the, they go into this knowing I'm going to do this and you're going to do that part and uh, let's go from here. And, and the arrangements have been very different. In some cases I've seen where the, the, comp, the, pr, the farmer actually retains part of the ownership of the compost or gets some portion of the revenue from selling compost. In other cases, that hasn't been true. So. Do you have some experience with that, Bruce or Jeter? As they, as they uh, develop their relationship, I think it becomes more important. And like the uh, case study pointed out, the rules have to maintain that so that each enterprise benefits, so it's mutually beneficial. And so I think it works its way through. It kind of evolves into the system that needs to exist. Yes. OK. One of the, uh, the, the main issues the producer kept describing was the economic factors. And obviously, you know, economics are, are critical. Um, but I'm wondering, are there other factors that farmers and producers need to look at? Now, Dan, you're with a, a, a public institution doing composting. Obviously, you, know, you are dealing with economics as well, costs, inputs, those type of things. But what other factors do producers need to be thinking about in terms of, uh, of considering composting? Well, as pointed out in the case study, economics are important. Uh, if, you know, if you can't maintain a, a viable economic operation, you won't be in business very long. But there are other factors that, that can destroy that relationship, and they're socially oriented. If you end up with a situation that's not acceptable by the public or the surrounding community, it can put you in, in real jeopardy as well. And it can, that can be politically uh, determining uh, on whether you stay in business or not. And also environmentally, if you don't, um, don't treat your environment properly, there'll be other sources that'll be, uh, be coming down on you. It could be agencies as well. So there's, there's more than just the economics involved. These other factors are very important. Okay. I was also curious, uh, in the, the clip, they talked about improving animal quality, quality through the composting process. Uh, Bob, can you elaborate on what they meant by that? Well, in that particular farm, again, because previously they used to uh, remove the manure only periodically, the lots could get pretty messy and wet, and um, um, the, the cows would uh, gather manure on their coats, and he, he called it wet hips. Uh, and when they got to the, to this, to the killing plant, um, there was a possibility that they'd be docked in price um, because of that damage or, or lesser quality. Um, so in this case, the compost, because they were able, because of the composting operation, they were able to clean the pens more frequently. The animals came out of the, uh, the lot cleaner and much less likely that they would be docked in price when they got to the slaughterhouse. Yes, Dan, you had I just might add that uh, if uh, that manure is allowed to get too deep in there and it becomes quite dusty, there can be some respiratory problems associated with the stock as well, and they keep that clean more frequently, so they, they reduce that aspect a, a bit too. Okay, great. Moving on to the second case study where we were looking at uh, animal mortalities, uh, the term was brought up biosecurity, and I'm wondering if somebody could explain for us what that means. Um, and perhaps uh, explain why other disposal methods may be a threat to biosecurity. Now, Bruce, you're a, you've worked with uh, animal mortalities and composting. Maybe you could handle that. Well, uh, on the case study with the chickens, for instance, their biosecurity issues relate heavily towards the truck traffic and, and transfer of 
of diseases between farms. So if you have a renderer, for instance, bringing their, their trucks onto your farms that have picked up mortalities at other farms, they're, they're very concerned about bringing diseases onto their farm, as well as transmitting it to other people outside of their farm, taking those pathogens. So the biosecurity aspect is really trying to maintain the integrity of your own livestock and uh, keep any pathogens out, as well as transmitting yours to other producers. Okay. Now we saw primarily small animals uh, being composted. Can you describe large animal composting for it? I know you have experience with some of that, some of the practices and methods that are used, and maybe talk a little bit about the successes of uh, that type of we, application. We started a small project with a graduate student uh, working at Utah State University, working with composting whole dairy cows, 1,200-pound cows on average. Um, we're just pretty much midpoint in it, but it appears to work pretty well. The keys to making that succeed, however, uh, appear to make sure that you have adequate carbon source, lots of saw, sawdust or a straw that works both to absorb liquids as well as provide biofilter for odors. I mean, we certainly, odors can be a problem when you've got that type of a system, and so uh, large amounts of carbon are, are needed for the process to work. Okay. I'm wondering if our other, other composters on the panel have had experience with uh, animal mortality composting, or uh, I know at Washington State University you have a veterinary uh, hospital here, you have animals that are here. Uh, are you considering using that as a disposal method? Our uh, first consideration will be a pilot study to see if that's viable uh, and probably start with some small animals. Uh, our our uh, removable process right now is uh, large animals go to the, uh, the necropsy lab at, uh, at the vet hospital and they go into rendering and uh, small animals that come out of some of the labs are uh, incinerated. So we're not dealing with mortalities at this time. Okay. Also, it, the composting methods used for the animal mortality uh, that we were, saw were primarily a uh, bin type of uh, method mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some of the other windrow, pile type methods. Um, are these other methods ineffective in terms of dealing with animal mortalities? Well, actually mortalities are, are composted in a number of methods. Bins apparently are the most common. Um, that's the method that was developed for the poultry industry and the poultry industry is the, the commodity area that uses mortality compost more than the others. But there are also rotating drums being used for mortalities. There are bins that are actually in the rearing houses, single bins where the, mort mort the morts are picked up every day and just put in the bin within the house and then covered with a little bit of litter. I've seen mortality composted in windrows outside with manure. Um, and in, in other in vessel systems, the large animal mortalities, such as the ones Bruce are working with, tend to be in open piles, um, well covered with amendment. Okay. So there are several methods. Bins are the most common. The uh, clip with the uh, fish hatchery in southern Idaho, in their bins, there it looked like there were quite a few flies around the the composting. There is that a particular problem with? animal composting? It's a challenge and in that particular project they did have um, some fly problems which have gotten better um, after they've learned how to, what amendments to use and how much amendments to use and how to handle the, uh, uh, the, the loading of the bins and things of that nature. Uh, I can't say they've eliminated the flies and I probably never will but I think they've gotten to a manageable, manageable level and it will be a challenge and it's one of the one of the things that need to be overcome when you're on that learning curve and how to, how to do this. I'm also wondering, Dan had mentioned about the, the social aspects of, uh, that uh, composters need to consider. Is there uh, a greater uh, situation with animal mortality composting in terms of public reaction or public perception of that? Uh, have you yeah. seen that, Bruce? Well, we've, we've talked about it quite a bit, and the pr public perception certainly can, can vary. We, in, in our process, we looked at, you know, the ultimate disposal of the product when you're done. And from a pathogen standpoint and a ca composting standpoint, the product is still probably pretty usable, but ultimately not socially acceptable. And so uh, most of the product will probably end up as a land application or as we saw in the case study with fish, it's just simply recycled in that composting operation where they have a 
a continuous load system that they have daily mortalities or weekly mortalities, so it just kind of stays within the system and we rotate it. Okay. I'd like to address some of the questions that have been phoned in or faxed in now. Uh, we've got a variety of questions, and I'll just throw them out, and, and whoever would like to answer them, please jump in. Uh, one question from Franklin City, Idaho. The nutrient quality uh, is different depending on content, uh, as an example, using dairy manure as compost. The questions are, what is the micro, macro nutrient level? Um, is the nitro ammonium nitrogen, or is it in nitrate form? And what is the potassium ratio? These are some chemistry questions, it appears. And uh, I, Bruce? I can, I'll start off with that one a little bit. I can give you some background on some studies we've done. and. First off, as far as the, the nitrogen, most of it is in, or, in an organic nitrogen form. Um, hardly any nitrate exists in the product. So um, you're looking at uh, probably somewhere around 2% or less total nitrogen, mostly in the organic form. The other nutrients, the potassium um, and phosphorus, will become concentrated as it's compared to manure because you've reduced the volume of that manure product. And the micronutrients will be the same as, again, concentrated uh, based upon what was in the actual manure product. The composting process won't, will not use up the phosphorus, potassium, and the micronutrients. But since we're reducing volume, the relative ratios or levels will actually increase because we've concentrated that manure product to a compost. Okay. I might add, though, that yes. um, the person who wrote the question is correct. The, the nutrient levels will change greatly depending upon the feedstocks what you're making True. the compost out of. So when Bruce says there's something around 2%, that would be typical of a dairy manure, cow manure. Okay, so it does depend on the feedstocks. Mm -hmm. uh, have a couple of general questions. Uh, one is uh, from Chester, Montana. And the uh, question is, are there benefits of composting beyond waste management, such as disease suppression and, or soil building? Dan, would you like to? Yeah, I could comment to the soil building aspect. Um, in our operation, the, the way that we process our, our compost, we pretty much volatilize off all the nutrient value mm -hmm. in, in the process. Uh, and as Bruce mentioned, it's in an organic state. And uh, in succeeding years, though, as this breakdown, this microbial breakdown takes place, there'll be uh, an organic availability to plant life. And so you'll enhance that uh, nutrition plane a bit. Uh, but water holding capacities are, are tremendous with this application, as well as building uh, tilth and, and humus and organic matter. So there's, there's much more to it than, than just the nutritional level. Okay. Uh, another question from Franklin City, Idaho, asks, uh, how do you maintain the composting process during severe weather conditions? I assume that may mean extreme cold, um, or I don't know if there are other severe weather, you know, downpours could be a problem. Yes, Peter? Well, as you see in the, in the uh, tour and the case studies so far, most of the composters are using a turned windrow method, which uses quite a bit of space. What I practice in western Washington is the uh, method area to static pile composting. And in that case, we have larger piles which have more uh, thermal retention. So when we have colder conditions, it's less impact than you would have on these smaller windrows. Uh, that seems to work out very well. Yeah. Composters do many things to adjust to varying weather conditions. Um, under severe, during seasons which are typically severe, might be um, extremely cold winters, some, some will stop and just compost during favorable weather. In that case, their back's not to the wall. They don't have to compost. And they have some flexibility. As you, you saw in the uh, case of Alberta, they actually uh, they compost through the winter and sometimes find that easier than, say, during the spring or the fall when it's wet. Uh, other composters will build piles bigger to retain heat or build piles bigger to retain moisture. Um, there's, there's, there are fleece covers um, that keep out moisture. There are th many practices that composters use to adjust to weather. Great. What we're going to do now, we've reached about the halfway point of our program, so we're going to take a short 10-minute break uh, to give you the opportunity during the break to, to get up, move about, stretch, 
uh, so that you're refreshed and ready to go when we come back. Uh, we, will, we have received a number of questions. We encourage you to continue to submit your questions even during the break. Uh, and we will address them in the second half of the program. We'll see you in about 10 minutes.